Kelly. Welcome to another exciting podcast for Luxury Homes to Loom. I'm here with my friend and my colleague, Rodrigo Lopez. Rodrigo, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us today because you know what? You're a special guy and he, he's got so much to share with you guys. He's going to educate, well, he's going to educate me and hopefully he's going to educate us about what's going on here. And he has an intensity and creativity and so many fresh ideas. I just can't wait to share this with, with you guys. All right, so thanks for staying with us. And if you're going to enjoy this, which I know you're going to enjoy this, please make sure that you subscribe to this YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram, all right? Don't forget that. You got it? All right. So now, Mr. Lopez, please tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you study? How did you end up in Tulum? So I started studying environmental engineering, first in Canada, in, in Waterloo. Then I moved back to Puebla. That's where I finished. And then I moved to Tulum probably three years and a half ago. And uh, I started working here because I love the place. I fell in love with the place. And my idea was that I wanted to have a home here. And that's how I ended up becoming a developer, if you can call me that. Um, and the idea was to get some land, uh, do a home where I wanted to live and try to do it as with everything that I learned in my career uh, and try to apply it and make it something real, right? Uh, that's when I met my partner, Ryan, and um, he's been working in many uh, construction projects, so we kind of, he also loved Loom, he loved the jungle, the vibe, everything about it, and we actually became partners on the phone. We didn't know each other, but we were introduced by my cousin and by my brother. He used to live in Chicago, I used to live uh, back in Puebla. And we met and that's the kind of things that Tulum do, you know, like it connects people and it, connect, it creates these certain weird situations that end up becoming big things. And uh, we, the first time we actually met in person was when we signed the company and when we did like the, all the paperwork and that was the first time we met. But obviously we've been talking a lot, um, he's super financial, super uh, creative in how to develop like this business model and I'm more into the sustainability part, design, and it was like a perfect match. And we started working here uh, three years ago when we first got to the land, it was just pure jungle. And that was what made us like super excited because we didn't want to develop um, I don't know, in a, in a more like gray area, this was like a, a white canvas for us to create whatever we could do, right? Right. And, um, and we saw the place, but we saw the land through a drone, so we couldn't even like walk towards <laughs> it. It was, you had to see it in the screen, like, yeah, there's some green land, but that's where Candela's gonna be. Trust me, he's <laughs> telling the truth, because when I tell people I live in the jungle, this project is in the jungle, right? Yes. It's really still under development and one of the first projects in the whole neighborhood, in your area. Yes, right? that's correct. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, so Region 15, which is where Candela is, back then was a couple of streets, but it was like very far towards the town, and we are between the town and the ocean. And we love the place because one of the things that we didn't want was to be in the middle of the city. We wanted to be far away uh, for construction and development to take some time to get onto where we are and that's actually what's been happening but we also wanted to create something that in a way we could share with our neighbors that if they see our project and understood the kind of project that we were doing they were gonna try to do something similar or getting the same wave as we were getting. So your objective in, in starting in the middle of the jungle was to set the standard exactly. for, the, for the neighborhood. Exactly. And I, I mean, I love that. That's amazing. We didn't want we, we to wanted wanted lead and not follow. You wanted to be leaders. In a way, and not from an egocentric part, but, but we also, we wanted to propose, you know, and I mean, or, or inspire in a way. If, if you like what we're doing, follow it or improve it, you know, but uh, we've seen other projects that we, we weren't so keen towards them and we have seen other people following uh, not the best initiatives, so we wanted to try to do the best initiative possible in the area that we were uh, developing and inspire other people to improve what we were doing over there. Actually, that is where the name of Candela comes from. Um, 
Tulum, El Castillo, which is one of the temples in the Tulum ruins. Uh, used to serve and work as a, as a beacon back for the Mayans where they were coming in a boat from Cozumel to Tulum. And it was a fire, uh, it was light, it was a candle, candela. And what we wanted to do with candela was to try to do a modern beacon. A beacon that could light how to develop, how to interact with the nature, with the surrounding, with the communities, with the culture. And that's the brand that we've been working on for the past three years. And, and that's the process that we've been uh, trying to build in this middle of the jungle. This is, so this is a concept that you came up long before you started building. This came up when you started forming the ideas, you, the company's even named after the concept. You know, come on, it's really easy to be like, you know, ABC builders or whatever, but to actually have a concept that's related to the local culture, that's a brilliant thing. I really, really like that. And I actually took a tour of those ruins that, that uh, we're talking about here. I took a, I've taken that tour about well, many times as you probably have as well. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that they use those torches, those beacons, those candelas, and there were three of them actually, right? Mm -hmm. And that they use them as a guide in order to enter through the reef. That's right. a fantastic story. I love that. And I'm, I, I still got to go back to this. So you formed your partnership. You did all of this over Zoom. Was this there? This was starting three years ago. So you guys were going back and forth, communicating basically through through Zoom and having meetings and conferences and planning and financial planning and doing all of this without ever, ever having met. Correct. <laughs> That's amazing. But you had a family connection there. We had a family connection. My brother, my brother and my cousin are the people with the highest standards for uh, talking high about people, you know? <laughs> so when both of them agree in saying like, you have to meet Ryan, Ryan is a good guy, and like, if you, both of you say it, I have like, nothing else to research about. He got the about. stamp, he got yeah, the stamp so, and you were not. Exactly, so, and, and he, I, I mean, we talked through the phone a lot, and you know, when you make a match in the way you think, and the way, one of the first things that we said is like, we're not gonna jump over the law. The first thing that we want to do is that if it stands, and sometimes the law is not the is not very well done, uh, that can be questionable. But if it's already a, a standard of how many villas or how many apartments you can build in the area where we bought, we said we have to start respecting the law. Yes. If we want to be this beacon, and if we want to inspire other people to do low density developments. Uh, to uh, try to conserve and, and, and preserve as much jungle as possible, we have to start by uh, following the law. Following the mandates, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and in one hectare, which was what we uh, bought back then and what we could acquire, we projected 12 villas. And that was like the first step. And when we had this conversation on the phone, he was on the same page. Like, yeah, sometimes Mexico sounds like it's a flexible country where you can actually do... Yeah, why don't you explain that to the, to the, to the viewers? Because if you've never been here or you haven't ever built or, li or even rented for long term, sometimes you'll see these anomalies growing up. You're like, all of these houses are like this level and then what happens? Sometimes you go off. Somebody decides they're going to build an extra level. They're gonna, and then, of course, that's against the, the building code. Let's talk about this called the building code. Yep. And they do it anyway, right? And it's like they get a slap on the wrist or they pay a $30,000 fine. Well, what kind of punishment is that? I mean, I think you and I would agree, you know, tear it down. There's a reason that we have that so that we can have some uniformity. And it also is, you know, it's, a, it's an eyesore. We have beautiful jungle uh, in front of us, behind us, and all around us. And if somebody builds uh, a tower that's two, to two stories too tall in front of us, that obstructs our view. That's really affecting my lifestyle. Totally. So it's, it's something that, that happens here. And, you know, you have to respect. I'm really, really, really respecting Rodrigo for this, this stance on maintaining integrity in building. Right? It's not just it's not just about being fashionable and beautiful and sustainable, but there's integrity involved here. And congratulations to you, props to you on that. Keep Thank that you. keep that shit going. Man. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to do the right thing. It's just the right thing to do. I agree, and I think that the right thing to do is it's on the developer side, but it's also on the buyer side. Oh, absolutely. Like you, you, it's it's important to ask the correct questions, like. What is the density? What are the maximum amount of units allowed here? Uh, how much jungle or green areas are you preserving? Uh, how are you managing the water? Water is a key element in this region and 
it's very superficial. It's one of the, the biggest uh, underwater connected systems in the world. And it's, it's fragile. At the same time, it's one of the most important attractives uh, from Tulum, you know, tourist attractions in Tulum. And we have to preserve that. So ask the developer, what are you doing for the water? How are you managing the water? What's happening to the wastewater? How are you treating it? What kind of technology? How are you filtering it? How are you putting it down in the water, bit, in the underground? Because there is, in the majority of Tulum, there is no sewage system. Correct. So, and I see there a very unique opportunity because I believe that there are certain places that are not designed like this place to have a complete network of a sewage system. It could be super interesting to see Tulum growing as a city and a place where everything is decentralized or as much as possible or especially water that is very hard to uh, put out and then take back, right? Correct. And if every developer can take uh, uh, in account how they need to manage the water, that could be a very interesting uh, future for this area, but also like a proof of concept that we don't all need to be connected and some things and some services can be off the grid. Makes perfect sense. I mean, the, the project where we are today, we also have our own little system, our contained system here, and I think you always have to give credit. And I love what you just said about we need to educate our buyers. We need to tell them understand what the differences are. The subtle differences are going to make a big difference in this region in, in the short, medium, and long term. Obviously, more in the long term than ever because we have to make the right decisions now. This is only going to get, sorry, this is friends, let's be honest because that's what I am. I'm so transparent. You can see what I had for lunch. We don't blow a smoke up anybody's skirts here. Tulum is exploding, exploding with tourism, with the amount of people who are coming here, with the amount of people who are coming here as tourists, and the amount of people who are coming here to live. And that's our business. I mean, he's a builder, and that's what I'm doing. Obviously, I'm selling real estate, helping our clients fill out their needs. But we have to be aware of the long-term consequences of decisions we're making today. And we, and, and we have to do it on a micro level because these things have macro effects. But let's say we talked about density. We were talking about preserving, let's say if your property is uh, a hectare. Correct. Right? Now, uh, so explain hectares into acres for our uh, US and Canadian customers. Uh, I, I, I still got thrown away. It's, it's what, like 2.4 2. 2. I think, 2. 4, I think 2. 2. acres. 4 acres in a hectare. So yep. it's a big space. It's a big space. It's a big space. But you, we're supposed to maintain how much of the natural vegetation what is the what does the building code tell us we should maintain here? Well, normally they let you use around uh, like I think it's sixty or seventy percent of the land, right. and you need to preserve around forty, 40. to thirty. Right. Yeah, and we kind of flipped it the other way. We only develop thirty percent of the land, and we preserve seventy percent of the land of the of the jungle. Let's talk about Cancun. Fifty years ago, was a long strip of beach. Mm -hmm. How has that changed in 50 years? Well, Cancun is a, <laughs> it's, it's a, a street of buildings, uh, basically, but Cancun has a special... Cancun was a design city by the government back then uh, when they decided to create this destiny or destination for, especially for the American and Canadian market. Yeah. And it was all designed in a desk for, for saying, right? Yeah. Uh, then Cancun exploded and then Playa del Carmen was like the next destination and people started going to Playa but in a more relaxed, chill way. It was already a, a town, like a, a, an organized and growing town, but it was a very relaxed, beachy town. Um, and then... And it exploded. It exploded. It, it completely exploded. exploded. Without the restrictions, I'm sorry here because like guys, the building, the building code there is not like the building code here. Uh, you can drive through many, 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 many blocks in Playa del Carmen, and I love Playa del Carmen. I'm not putting it down. I'm just going to say that they don't have the restrictions that we have here in order to maintain the green spaces because there's a lot of concrete in Playa del Carmen. The beach is stunning. There are beautiful places to, with beautiful views. But if we're talking about green space within units mm -hmm. at Candela, in Yaxulum, in different areas, those green spaces are integral to having a good lifestyle. Correct. Right? I mean, we know in urban planning, uh, 
very, very thing is world, world planners always want what? They want green spaces, they want parks, they want play areas, they want communal areas that interact with the individual as a human being, right? We still need to be organic. We need to touch trees and touch grass and get our feet dirty. We do that at the beach, but we can also do that here. These are things that are important basically in the quality of life that we have here. So what Rodrigo is doing here is super, super important in maintaining as much of this vegetation as possible. And anyway, when you check out uh, when you check out this website, which we're going to have posted here, you're going to see the videos, you're going to see some of the images that we have of what's going on there, but we'll talk about that later. So now let's talk about water. You are, you are really, really hitting on a key issue here, we've, and we've talked about this historically. Tulum was super important as a trade route because there's a lot of water here. There's a lot of underground water here. When we drive from here or if we see aerial views, there are cenotes everywhere in this region which are just basically the sinkholes which connect all of these underground water systems, right? So now how are we going to keep this water? For real, how are you, what are you doing at Candela to keep this water? Because they have a plan. Well, we, we've been working, um, I think one of the key things about Candela is that we, we acknowledge from the beginning that we don't know everything or basically we don't know nothing, right? So what, what we do is that we try to partner in every single thing that we, initiative that we want to uh, push with the best partner possible. So in specifics for the water, we kind of, the design or, or how we conceive the water was to say like, okay, I'm standing on the water that I want to drink, right? And I'm putting back in the soil the water that I want to drink tomorrow. So if you think of that, like water from that point of view, you stop looking at water like if it's uh, a waste, exactly. but it's more like an active that you're going to be using and using all the time. So uh, for Candela, we hired two different companies. One is called uh, Watch Water and Lonely Soul. They are in Merida. I'm sorry, it's called Watch Water, Watch water uh -huh. and Lonely Soul. So they kind of import two different type of technologies. Some okay. of the technologies from Europe, some of the technologies uh, from the US, but they designed the filtration system. So they extract, we extract the water from the underground. Uh, it goes through a process of fil filtering, uh, CO lights, uh, activated charcoal, um, some resin, and then the water that we want to drink, that it's the one that is on the, on the kitchen, uh, it goes through a reverse osmosis uh, filtration. Then uh, the rest of the water goes to the showers, bathrooms, everything, and once it's used, it goes to four different uh, water treatment plants that are installed in each one of the corners of Candela. So you have four plants, four for, plants. for only 12 villas. Correct. That sounds amazing. So you have a lot of capacity, so the system's not overworked. You Correct. Have small systems for each three. And it's important uh, to, so when, whenever one of the villas not in use, the rest of the villas are providing food for the uh, water treatment plants. Okay. And these water treatment plants were designed in Czech Republic and that's important because they meet the European standards which are higher than the Mexican standards so they, these are like pre-manufactured um, water plants that you just like dig the place, put the plants and just connect them which is super practical and it's very important to know that for developers and for uh, clients that end up buying that this is something easy to buy, it's not that expensive it, it, it adds certain cost uh, to the project, yes, but it's something that is very reliable, that is uh, already in the market and that they are producing right now in Mexico. And they, yeah, so the long-term benefits are going to far outweigh the, the minimal increase in the cost. Completely. I mean, it's an investment. Completely. And uh, this company is called Team Thinking Mexico. Uh, these guys also came from Europe, established in Mexico and started producing. So now if you end up buying these plants, uh, these are made and manufactured by Mexican uh, jobs, right? So Fantastic. Where, are they, where do they manufacture these? These guys are in Mexico City right. and they ship the, the plants to here. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's there are many fantastic. already in the area that are using this technology. And you were saying about like what is the, the importance of the greenery is that today you come to Tulum, I've seen toucans, a uh, group of birds of, of uh, um, I don't know the name in, in, in English, but uh, woodpeckers, uh -huh. um, this blue, uh, like, cotorro, like, you see all sorts of birds, 
And one of the ideas here is that if everyone preserves this big amount of, of greenery, then you kind of still have like this ecosystem connected throughout the projects, right? So we kind of had to start rethinking that this grid doesn't have to be just concrete jungle, like probably what happened to Playa del Carmen, but what Tulum has right now and what's in Tulum's hands is that we are redefining how to develop a city attached or next to a jungle, how we integrate with the ecosystem and how the ecosystem becomes part of the urban and, and, and the city that we are creating. The plan, the overall plan has to include this. Correct. If not, we just repeat mistakes which have been made all over the world. Exactly. Yep. And we, you know, we, it's, it's not good for us, not good for the environment, it's not good for our industry. It's not good, well, and if we don't have our environment here, let's talk about this because we go through, we're, we're a very, we're very environ, environmentally sensitive industry and zone right here. For example, when we have when we have problems with Sargasso, Sargasso is going to affect the beach. It's going to affect the number of visitors who want to come during the Sargasso season when it happens. People don't want to come. They don't want to see the. They don't want to see tons of algae on the beach. I know there are people that save up for years and years and years for the vacation, and then they come to you know somewhere in the Caribbean, and then they see all of this this Sargasso. It's very very bad for for us if we don't do what we can to minimize that. And I'm just speaking now on a global issue because this is, has a lot to do with global warming and yeah. has to do with the waste that we're putting in the water. Uh, so these are things that we have to control and these are things that we can mitigate that effect. If we don't, then eventually we're going to end up in a place where it's not going to be very attractive and we're going to be, uh, um, we're all going to be regretting not making those decisions today. Correct. So you've taken the initiative. So I am so happy about the what you've done. Now tell me about the tell me about your your project in Candela. So we have these twelve villas. Mm -hmm. Now these twelve villas, because I've seen these twelve villas, are set up in a circular pattern, all facing. Well, they don't face inwards. They kind of the edge of them faces to the inner circle. Right. And then they face, I guess, laterally. Right. Correct. They like face the lateral. So the, the thesis behind it, uh, our architects are called Macias Peredo. These guys are incredibly sensitive and they understood from day one what we wanted to do in this place and they connected with the vision that we had uh, for Candela. They connected with the place, with uh, Tulum, and, and they knew that they had to do something special. Um, in, in order to only develop 30%, they needed to go upwards instead of, of spreading, right? Correct. So um, what we have is a three-level villa that where you have like the first floor, then you have the second floor, uh, then uh, the third floor, and then a uh, rooftop in the, at the very end. Um, and what was very important was that we wanted to provide privacy, right? We wanted to for you to have your own villa with your own ecosystem because we are creating big villas, right? There are four or five bedroom bed, uh, villas which can hold up to 13, 14 people more or less. So you're coming here with a group of friends or with a family. So right. you're creating your own ecosystem inside of this ecosystem. And uh, the villas go up as a, in a pyramid shape. There's pyramid steps, right? Exactly. Because if you guys, when you see the images, you'll really appreciate this, is how that relates to where we are and to the Mayan culture. It's, they're beautiful, beautiful villas. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm the effect, that's, that's exactly what they wanted to create. Like having this, this feeling of arriving to a place that, you, that feels like going to an ancient Mayan place where you don't know what was there first, if the nature or the architecture. You know, like making a complete merge between one and the other. And if it actually gives you that feeling. You are all the time, like every time you go a step higher and you interact with the nature, with the trees at different heights, it's, it's incredible. And once you get to a rooftop and you see like the top of the trees, the birds coming in the afternoon, leaving in the morning, the sun, uh, rising, the sun set it, it's, it's incredible. And that experience was very well conceived from the beginning for, uh, with the architects, but they really, really did a very good job. And in the middle we have 1,500 square meters, which you, you can help me translate. Times, times 10.76. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, around what? Like 1500? 20, no, 10 times 1500. Okay. Uh -huh, 20, okay. Like 20, 20,000. 20, 20,000 square feet. feet. Of only preserved jungle in the It's all green. And uh, guys, this is full mature growth. You're talking about three, four stories tall. These are very, very beautiful mature trees. Yeah. These aren't like shrubs that grew up and just kind of, these aren't weeds that grew up in your backyard in, in Kansas City. Trust me, <laughs> these are big, beautiful trees. And so, tell me about the building materials because you have this, you have this jungle environment and then you have this pyramid shape and then you're finishing your acabados, we say in Spanish, we have chocum, we have some beautiful local wood, limestone. local limestone. Tell us about the, the materials that you use and why you chose those materials. Well, first first of all, we wanted to choose the local materials, right? And the inspiration was the pyramids that, that the Mayans already built and how they built it. So the first one is limestone, the, the stone that you have here that is super hard. But if you go into the place and you dig a little bit just in the ground, every single place that you dig, you're going to find small, um, um, how you call them, like shells, you know, it's kind of like a fossil because it used to be an ocean yeah. and you see all the shells uh, lying around the land and that is incredible because you're kind of like standing in a big, big, huge old fossil. Nice fossil. So I heard this term and tell me maybe this is wrong. Conchuela. Conchuela, see. Si. Conchuela is that stone that has those those shells embedded in the it. The conchuela that is, is that is a type of stone. That That's not the one that we use because uh -huh. we use the one that we dig from the, the real from the the, right out of the, the correct, uh -huh. which makes it a lot more sustainable because you don't have to bring it from someone else. You don't do like carbon emissions, those kind of stuff. But also the the stone is super hard, oh, yeah. so it helps you give you like a very good foundation. So all the villas are uh, the foundations are done with that stone. Nice. And then uh, the rest of it, it's finished with uh, chukum, which is like the Mayan uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. That the difference is that they use this chukum resin. Uh, chukum is a tree, mm -hmm. and when they make, mix it with the with the cement, it creates this texture that it's super smooth, super fresh, and it gives you like this freshness to the whole villa. Uh, and we use chukum for the outside and also for the inside. Both the same colors, and what chukum gives is a natural aging on the facade, and it looks incredible because this is just done, but it kind of feels like it's been there for many years. For many years. Yeah. And one of the things that I love about the chukum is like, and I always relate it to like a piece of a beautiful leather, right? It has its own texture, it has its own personality, it has its own history, and that's how Chikum feels. And you know, we have clients that are not familiar with it, and they're like, well, that wall's dirty. And no, 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 that wall's not dirty at all. That's a natural blending. That's how this resin mixes in naturally with the cement, and then you get these variations. It's like, and then, and it goes anywhere from like a, like let's call it a honey color or an amber color. There are all different variations, I guess, depending on the, the amount of chikum that's in the And the chikum. amount of dirt you, you put uh -huh. on it. And because it uses natural uh, elements, so we use the dirt from candela. So the, actually the, 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 the dirt from the, the white, the side the is ground. used yes. to build it. And that's why it gives like, it's a special color. And if you put more of it, then it goes dark. And if you put less, then it goes lighter. But what's incredible about chikum is that it's done in sight, but there are maestros chukumeros, so like the masters of chukum, and it's like this profession that it passes from one to another, and their profession is to be experts in chukum, because you have to do a perfect finishing, and you can see the hand of each one of the masters, like one, it's a little bit wider, some of them are a little bit, uh, you know, like closer or smaller, one goes in circles, one goes horizontal, it's incredible because you see the hand process on the villa because in the end the whole villa is kind of like a sculpture because all of the basement of the villa each one of the rocks was hand carved right also by a master that only knows and he's an expert of giving the proper corners to each one of the rocks to fit with the next one and then to give a perfect uh, straight wall to make that that is a base sculpture and then you have to do the finishing 
which is also a very manual and very traditional job. That's fantastic indeed. It's going to be a, a the, the finished product is so beautiful. And I can tell you when you see these finishings at night, the, 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 the variations that you just mentioned, you can see them at the, if you're sitting at a particular angle, you'll see that wall completely different. And then if you're you know facing it straight on the next night, you're like, I didn't notice that. And you just, yeah. it's, 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 like, it's like a living piece of art. Completely. It's a beautiful thing. And it changes the color with the type of light. You know, at some point it looks a little bit like lighter, then it becomes a little bit pink. And then in the afternoon it's a little bit more orange, so it, it evolves with, with, with the timing of the day. Perfect. Now tell me about what woods do you use in your construction? So we are using tornillo, which is from the area. Tornillo? Tornillo. Tornillo, like a screw? Yeah, a that's, screw? that's, that's called, the name of it. That's the name of the wood? That's for the fixed uh, carpentry. Okay. Uh, and then we're using pukte for the um, furniture that we are uh, providing in Candela. All the furniture and all the interior design project was done by other team of architects that partnered with uh, Macias Peredo for this project. They're called Habitación 116. I personally believe they are the best interior designers today in Mexico and many other countries that I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> but they are incredible and they have like this incredible taste and they understood Tulum very well and they understood that for Candela they wanted to uh, give this feeling of being in this amazing and incredible place uh, that has the best technology, that has the best finishes, but is not showing the luxury to your face, you know? For them, luxury was to be barefoot on your home and feel the earth in a way to uh, be open a window and then be outside but at the same time come inside and then delete these edges between the outside world and the inside world. Um, hiding the technology, so they, they, all the TVs are, are hidden, so you don't have to be looking at a TV that is not turned on. The fridge... <laughs> As I look at my TV... <laughs> I mean, now, you're, now you're embarrassing me! <laughs> I, 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 I can put you in contact with them. No way, I can't, you know, like, I can't tell you. I've seen, I've seen this in, like, actually the, the big TVs, the spaces that they have. There's a, there's, a, there's a nook in the wall, so it's, it's, it's not flush with the wall, and actually the screen is flush, so it's set back in the wall. And then these big pieces of uh, these panels, are they basically right. panels of wood are going to slide back and forth to, to conceal them when they're not in use. Beautiful, beautiful use of space, of design. And there, so are your, are your units sold furnished? Yes, well, you, you, can, you can buy the package. You can buy the, the, you can buy package. the package, correct. Uh -huh. And um, the What's important about this package is that it was the chairs are designed for Candela. So it's like the first edition of this type of chair that we already have on site. And this was done obviously handmade, uh, the fabrics, but also the wood uh, work. And it's a, it's a chair that it's lower than a normal chair. And the idea was to bring you closer to the ground and making you, just by how you sit, feeling that you are in a relaxed place because you're almost sitting on the floor but you're like kind of chilling and just by that, those sort of, sort of details and actions is like what makes it a complete difference in, in the furniture. Um, one of the things that they proposed which was, it completely blew our minds, uh, was that, well candela is it's a candle, right? And in Tulum it's common that since it's a growing town and there's uh, construction and movement and, and a lot of things happening, uh, we get a lot of storms, so sometimes you may have like shutdowns of energy, right? Sometimes. <laughs> we have them frequently. Well, and, and the idea was like, instead of complaining about that, how can we see an opportunity there? And okay, so when the light goes out, we have niche all over the place for candles. And the first thing we give you when you arrive and you rent a villa in Candela is we give you your set of candles. So in the afternoon, even if you have light, you can light your whole villa just with candlelight. Oh my God. And give you this oh feeling of actually be disconnected, which is one of the main reasons why people come to Tulum, right? Right. Absolutely. Connect with the place, but disconnect from the yeah. other the technology. World, technology, world. exactly. Yeah. And Candela gives you that opportunity. And so you have four and five bedrooms, so that's perfect size for a rental. So if you guys know that, if you're looking for a place to come down and you want to rent space for a day, for a week, not for a day, for a week, a month, or six months, uh, these properties are so perfectly designed for that. This is like a beautiful, 
Oh, it's just a, it's just a way to to refresh and recharge yourself because as I said, as you just mentioned, these subtle factors are gonna make your experience relax. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of chill in Tulum, right? We do chill a lot here, yeah. right? In comparison to other places in the world, we do chill. So I think that you guys are gonna really, really enjoy it. If you're gonna rent a property here, make sure that you check out Candela, right? In region 15. We're gonna give you all the information. I hope you're enjoying this podcast. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got, again, we're gonna have Rodrigo's information on there, Candela's information. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us and su subscribe. I'm having a hard time with subscribe today. I think I, need, I think this needs to be vodka. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that's it. Tequila. And subscribe to our. I'm a mezcal guy now. Oh, I used to be a tequila guy. Now I'm a mezcal guy. Perfect. I'm learning mezcalitas with tahin around the room. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're becoming some of my good friends. So yeah, if you guys want to see those properties, make sure that you contact me, Kelly, at Luxury Homes to Limb. I can take you there. I'll be happy to show you the beautiful, beautiful project. But I know that you have other projects going. Correct. That, uh, you know, this is not a man that's just sitting on his laurels about this fantastic project they just designed, designed and then they're executing. He's got bigger plans. Tell us what else is going on, Rodrigo. Tell us the truth. Well, I have to thank Tulum because I think it, everything was conceived here, like when Ryan and I started to come here and then we understood that Candela wasn't just for Tulum, like we were creating this community uh, with a lot of uh, standards and vision and philosophy. Uh, we wanted to expand it and say like, okay, if we are doing this cool and great community in Tulum, can we do the same in other places? Yeah. And the second step, and we it was also kind of like magical how we got there. Um, there was we went to find some candles, handmade candles to Valladolid. Which if you haven't been to Valladolid, you have to next time. Love it. Love it's it. It's an incredible it. place. I believe it's gonna be like the San Miguel de Allende or the Mayan Riviera. And we went to Valladolid to find some candles. And in the process of looking for the candles, we ended up in Plaza de la Candelaria, which is a, yep. a beautiful plaza which made, it was kind of funny, Candela, Candelaria. <laughs> and uh, we didn't find the candles though, but we were already there and there was a sign in one of the lands, uh, a piece of, a big piece of land, a very cool piece of land in this pedestrian area, uh, next to a church, next to a very old building that was the first place where uh, they started producing uh, Enneken in that area in Valladolid, then it became a, 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 a jail and then it became, uh, now it's a, a library that is not in, uh, that they're using for like uh, public um, speeches and for kids and, and doing like cultural stuff and we met with the land, we called the owners and we ended up closing it, we didn't know back then what was the next step until we said like yeah this is gonna be the second candela you know like we want to keep the brand which is super important for us and for people to know that we want Candela to grow as a brand that develops these regenerative and sustainable communities around Mexico in areas where people can come to connect with the culture, with the nature, with the gastronomy, with what each one of these places has to offer. And each Candela adapts to the place, not the place to Candela. So we try to understand where we are arriving and then create something special there. Um, so that's the second one. That's hand. amazing. What a great story. And then? And then we have... And you have one more in the works or two more? So we have three more on the oh. pipeline. <laughs> well, the last time we talked, I think it was two. Now there's another one. Mm. We're spreading, especially we are exploring this area. And the Mayan River has so much to offer. It's an incredible place. We, we, we fell in love with the place. But there are very other interesting places. And what I like... What we want for people is that when you experience Candela and the things that you leave at Candela inspire you uh, to change or to evolve whenever, you, wherever you go back home, uh, but to leave you some change. You know, it wasn't just fun, it wasn't just a retreat or, or peace, but it actually inspires you to change. So we are creating these initiatives for Candela, which will be implemented in each one of the communities. Uh, the first one is the water that we talked about. The second one is all the organic waste. We transform it with a local company here in Tulum.
to compost and then the compost uh, is given to uh, Daniel and he has an organic farm and he produces uh, food that is given back to the owners of Candela or the people that are renting the Candela Villas. That's amazing. So we amazing. close the whole loop. It's complete the cycle. Completely circular. Um, also, when you arrive to Candela, we give you the opportunity. We partner with another company from Mexico City called New by Granel. And basically what they do is that all the amenities that you will be using, such as shampoo, soap, cream, you pick the type of scent, you pick if, it, if you want it to be uh, honey, if you want it to be lemongrass, and then you fill these containers that you use and then you just give them back. So we, we help you not to produce waste. And we also do the same process with all the cleaning supplies for the villas. So we are pushing these boundaries, we're moving towards uh, uh, renewable energies as well, uh, all of these uh, amenities that we are providing, we are working with local communities, local producers, apicultures, that they give, you, give us the, all these um, amenities that we will be end up selling inside of Candela. So even though you're taking a lot of things, uh, like these are a lot of Mexican uh, products and producers and you're, you're, you're partnering with a lot of locals basically. Correct. And this is a, another thing about Tulum, you guys need to know there's a lot of like-minded people here. There are people who are aware, that are socially conscious, they are aware of the environment and they're connecting with each other. It sounds like you've connected. He is also connected with our very dear friend Stephanie Farr from Maya Loops. They have worked together on several different initiatives as well and I think Correct. he just described one of them. But it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful project and I, I, I just, you're so inspiring. I want to thank you for what you're doing for our community here. I really, really appreciate your work, your creativity, your your drive, your ambition, and your vision. I do want to thank you. It's been amazing. Um, again, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, and you'll find all of this information. Again, a big, big, big thanks to our friend Rodrigo, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Y adiós. Gracias. Thank you.